there are so many ways for us to reinvent the way we practice architecture. Hello and welcome back Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more profitable and impactful architectural practice. And today's episode will be no exception because today I'm joined by the illustrious co-hosts of the ArcaSpeak podcast, Mr. Mm -hmm. Evan Troxell and Cormac Phelan. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome. How are you doing? How is I'm doing well. Thanks. Yeah, doing well. Yeah, Got good some... to be here. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. This is, a, this is a reunion of the OGs, the OGs of uh, architectural social media internet. We had a few less gray hairs, and um, what else? <laughs> a few more brain cells. A little more spring, more in, brain our <laughs> a little more, a little spring in our yeah, step. Yeah, we'll go with that one. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so those of you who are, are a frequent Business of Architecture podcast listeners, as always, thank you for tuning into the show. We love your support. We love your comments. We love your reviews. We love providing value to you. And I'm super excited for this episode. If you're not a listener to the ArchiSpeak podcast, which I'm sure you are, because I think these guys dwarf our podcast in size, uh, which is a note, by the way. It's uh, If you have more friends to listen to the Business of Architecture podcast, please do that. But these guys known them for a long time, happy to have them on the podcast today. And in, as we were kind of kicking off the show today, there were so many topics we could talk about. And Evan kind of brought up a, a really good, a couple of good points. Number one is he said he's trying to work less. I'm sure all of us can identify with that. <laughs> we're, we're hearing that yeah. everywhere, right? And nobody yeah. wants to work anymore is the other version of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah except we're the, uh, what, what are you guys? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, um, I think I'm a Gen Xer. Well, we're all yeah. Xers. Do you guys Gen know what you guys oh, yeah, are? We're all Xers. You guys are yeah, all Gen Xers. So yeah. it's sort of like a curve, right? Like the Gen Xers, now the Gen Xers don't want to work too. We're like, right. hey, have we, those We're, millennials have it right. You know, it's interesting. We've had this conversation about the fact that, you know, we came up with a group, the boomers, you know, our, our mentors that were, you know, do everything, you know, work, 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 work. And the Gen Xers, you know, that, that was, you know, it's just like, well, I'm not going to rely on anybody else. I'm going to do it myself kind of, you know, thing. <laughs> Total self-reliance. So, you yeah. know, we were kind of the, the like work martyrs, I guess, if you want to call it that. And, and I've been working more and more with millennials and Gen Zs that look at us and say, why are, why, why, why do you have to do that? Why do you have to work 16 hours a day? I mean, you know, aren't we scheduling properly? Aren't we staffing properly? And, and honestly, <laughs> you know, it, it, I mean, short answer is, you know, sometimes or most of the times probably no, but it really is kind of calling us out on our bad habits of like, you know, we don't, there, there is a better way of doing this than what you've been doing, you know, your entire career. And most of the time, as you, you guys said, it's like, you know, people that, you know, we think, oh, people just don't want to work. No, they're actually right. I mean, why are we, you know, kind of suffering for our art when there is a better way to do it by, you know, being honest and truthful with ourselves and like, oh, it's not going to take me three weeks. It's going to take me three months, you know, proper scheduling, you know, proper staffing, you know, things like that, just being truthful and, and then getting to the point where you're like, yeah, you're right. We don't have to kill ourselves for this. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, I saw recently a list of like the good qualities, and this is going to be <laughs> kind of couched in air quotes about architects and the, the training that we got when we were in architecture school and kind of what that, what good qualities that instills in you so that you can go out and do an, have an amazing career. And like number one and number two were like work hard and long hours. It was both of those like in succession, <laughs> right? And, and we, it's yeah. true. We did learn how to do those things, and the generation that came before us expected those those same two things, and our professors instilled it into us in school, in architecture school. And and I think as Gen Xers who were very much like do-it-yourselfers, mm -hmm. right, and, and, and not going to rely necessarily on other people, all of that compounds to, for us to just be like, oh, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we didn't question it, to your point, Cormac, <laughs> yeah. right, which is now... The, the generations are actually questioning that and just saying why it's just like a like my kids asked me through their entire you know growing up and adolescence right it was just like why 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 you know you've you've raised kids you know what i'm talking about that's the question it doesn't matter what the answer you give them because there's another why coming at some point i think we actually cormac that's something we've talked about a lot on arca speak right which is we started to 
say, you know what, you're right. Well, why? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, why? Yeah. <laughs> and now, and now I think we are kind of wondering. I don't, I don't necessarily know if there's a better way, Cormac. You said there must be a better way. I'm not quite sure there's a better way because I don't. I, it's been built like this. Yes. Yeah. It's been built to work like this, and so you actually kind of do have to either look outside of architecture at other models or you have to figure out new ways of doing things, which takes a lot of effort when you have a deadline this week on a project. So are you actually going to be able to take the time to start? I know, uh, Enoch, this is where you come in with the business of architecture, right? And starting up, setting up business systems for success early on so that you can actually do your art because you have the systems and the business in place. But but we are at a disadvantage because this... This is the way we've always done it, right? We've heard that so many times from from the elders in our communities, <laughs> right? Uh, and and also as just kind of a retort of why would we ever want to try something else? This works just fine. Um, so there's a lot swirling around here. And so when I think about working less, I think you're right, Cormac. It's actually more about boundaries. I'm not actually... I don't need to work like only a few hours right. a day. I need to work a normal day. I love work. I love doing a great job. I love figuring stuff out. But at the same time... I don't need to work 16, 18, 20 hours a day to accomplish something right. that clearly doesn't take that much time. Well, I, just as a, as a add to that, um, you know, we've talked on the Arc Speak podcast um, about, you know, Evan brought this up. He's like, what would I do if I were restarting, you know, my, you know, my own business? And I know that you talk about this all the time, Enoch, and it's, really about, okay, how do we reframe and maybe detach ourselves from a lot of the bad habits that we've, you know, established? It's not talking about, you know, like removing the grind or really working hard to get, you know, to be successful, but it is starting to have the conversation with you. It's like, why do I have to do all of these, insert whatever you do for sacrificing your, you know, your, your personal life or your family time or, you know, uh, professional growth because you're doing other things to make sure that, you know, you have your, you know, the, the overhead coming in. And, and those are the things, you know, like we had talked about, you know, tools and, and, and automation and things like that. We also talked about, you know, like it being a mindset. And I know you talk a lot about mindset and, you know, a mindset of, why do we have to sacrifice ourselves to the greater good if what we're trying to do is reinvent the greater good? I don't know if that made sense, but I'm going with it. <laughs> what the last part? Re- rem- what do you mean reinvent the greater? Just to good? mean, Tell you know, like that. If so, let, let's let's talk about specifically your audience, and you know, a lot of them are are wanting to get out of the big firm culture start their own small firm and they're reinventing themselves. And for them, it is about either control, maybe wanting more time, maybe wanting to, you know, more money. Um, and, and that to me is the greater good that they're trying to seek when they're going and trying to do something else. And so then the question is, is, okay, how do you reinvent what, how you practice to be able to achieve that greater good? That's what I meant. Yeah, got it. Thank you. I mean, it was just so poetic. <laughs> I needed a bit of an interpretation. You know? That's what I'm. That's Cormac say, That's what I'm known for. <laughs> the poetry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. It's perfect. Perfect. Well, it's it's a great conversation. I was speaking to. It's not uncommon for us to have. You know, obviously, we work with a lot of firm owners, and uh, firm owners come to us because they want and they want a different way of doing things that it's been done in the past. For some, for whatever reason, they've they've decided that. The way we've always done it isn't good enough. I think there's something better than than the way it's been done before. And absolutely, we, we see a divide in our program. And I, I joke with our, our, our firm leaders who are maybe a little bit older than I am. And yeah, the, the comment about this younger generation, it's hard to find people with work ethic and everything like that. It comes up again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And we've had the opportunity, you know, Ryan and I in the program, It's we've had some great conversations with, with these firm owners because we'll, we'll, we'll say, well, I mean maybe these kids have a point. Like, what would it look like if you did work less 
And let's say you could keep the same income, the same proficiency, the same everything else, but you were actually working less with, is that necessarily a bad thing? And then we start looking at it differently. We're like, ah, oh, okay, well, that doesn't sound so bad after right. all. Maybe, maybe we could do that. I think part of it is because of the kind of digital native uh, nature that these younger generations have come up in, and they recognize the power of technology and what it can do through automation where older generations did not have that, right? right? They've, mm, they maybe have transitioned point. into digital, and it's, it's as simple as things like parking lots and bathroom stall layouts, right? It's like you could literally start there and never have to draw another parking lot again, <laughs> but we do. We choose, we make the choice to say, here's AutoCAD, which hasn't, you know, start drawing. Yeah. Just start drawing and learn. Th you, there's, you definitely learn by doing that, right? I think Enoch, even in our last conversation, Cormac, you were, you were talking about this, like you, you were drawing and they, at the end of the day, they came up and they crumpled the drawings up and threw them away, yeah. right? Beca because it, it was like, no, that wasn't what we were expecting, but now we know what you thought we were asking and now we can show you how to really right. do it. So I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater, but at the same time, it's like we literally never have to draw a parking lot from scratch again. You, there are algorithms, just to say it plainly, that can do these kinds of things. And yet there's still a decision made every single day in firms to do these things the manual way. Right. And I mean, Cormac, Cormac, to your point earlier, when I said, you know, if I was going to start my own practice today, I would choose an extremely different tool set than I would have five or 10 years ago. Yeah. I would not choose kind of the, the usual suspects of AutoCAD or, you know, not to say that the deliverables have really changed right. that much. They haven't. Like jurisdictions still want a PDF and that PDF is sheets with drawings mm -hmm. on them. But in order to get to that state, I would choose probably a different, much different and much smaller tool set than I would have before. Um, and that just points to you know, what I'm familiar with, with technology and what I'm willing to accept with technology, where a lot of people are turning their back on right. that. And, and they're just saying, no, we're still going to do it like the way we've always done it. It takes this many hours and hours can be a big number to accomplish these things when it really doesn't need to be. And that's where these younger generations are going to be like, oh, you have to be kidding me. Like, why are we spending our time doing things that we do not need to be spending our time doing? Yeah, that's going to get, it gets very demoralizing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you right. Know, you're like, why am I doing? I don't, I, I don't see purpose here. I don't see purpose in what I'm doing. How am I contributing? Yeah. So it's interesting you say it that way. It's like you know, if you think about it, the, the kind of the manual way of doing drawings. I remember one time, I was told that it was, you know, it on average took about seventy two hours to do a single sheet, you know, sing, single drawing sheet. And I extrapolate that to what I've been able to produce for you know a current project right now that is in the thousands of sheets for you know a, a very large project but still nonetheless you know thousands of sheets thousands of of, of details and things so you're in the 70 72 thousands of hours say, <laughs> so let's <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say let, you know there has got to be a smarter easier way and you know and, and i think that mm. our smarter easier way has been decently you know decent with it right now but i think that you're right there is absolutely a different kind of like tool to automate certain things that we do um, assist in other things you know some of the monotony of things that we do to make a meaner leaner kind of practice that takes a lot of like the monotony i mean because this is you know like this can go into a, a, a much deeper conversation about like how can we leverage ai to you know benefit us and and you know how do we use the tools to you know to benefit us and things like that but you know i always took it when we were having this conversation you know about the new toolbox evan as you know there are so many ways for us to reinvent the way we practice architecture so that we can actually regain some of that uh, that time that we lose, you know, trying to overdo or over design or continue to design to the very end things that we, we would normally do. It's just like, it's, it's time to break ourselves of the bad habits. That's, yeah. and that's what it comes down to the bad yeah. habits. I, re I remember, um, I had a, I had a guest on the podcast. It was, uh, it was a while ago. He, he, he didn't, he, wa he didn't want to talk about this publicly and I respected <laughs> that. But he, he ran a very small practice, maybe him and a couple other people. And 
uh, one thing I really enjoyed, just I just noticed in our podcast booking process that he was very organized. He had automated emails that went out. He had an automatic calendaring system. I'm like, I like this guy. He's like a systems nerd like me. I've always been the systems nerd guy. You know, it's like the little tool set to save time. And so as we were talking in the conversation before we got on the air, I was kind of asking him how much he brings home from the practice, whatever. He, I think he was making around 800000 right, which is damn impressive for a small yeah, yeah. That's way, way above the bell curve. Yeah. I mean, as you guys know, you know, as, as a small firm architect. And, and I was like, well, you willing to talk about that on the show? He says, no, I don't. I don't want to because it'll just blow people's minds and they'll they'll think weird things about me. And it just, it never turns out to be a good conversation. Interesting. But, yeah. Wow. And, so the ones who are doing it well, doing it successfully, don't want to talk about, well, the ones I'm generalizing <laughs> here, but he didn't want to talk about it and like set an example as an outlier, right? Which yeah. is crazy because yeah. we talked on our last episode, which will, Enoch, I hope you link to the episode of ours that you I were did, just yeah, on just dropped, for yeah. this podcast mm-hmm. because um, we we talked about that scarcity mindset. You brought it up, right? right? This yeah. we have this idea that that these resources are precious. The hours that we have is and and, and it's he he's basically figured out ways to accomplish way more than people assume can be done as a small firm architect he's totally doing it but doesn't want to talk about it because yeah. he is going against the grain right everybody yeah. else is zigging and he's zagging he's exactly. going and yeah. and that's that's pretty that's telling of of kind of the, some of the root problems inside of our profession i'm wondering if in you know you don't have to divulge any information you know on your conversation with him, but i'm wondering if the way that he the reason why he's reluctant is more about it's like, well, people will criticize because I'm not doing it the way that everybody else is doing it. Or I'm I'm breaking out of the mold of how we've all done it before. And I don't want to catch, you know, all this grief for, you know, being a different architect. And and, and I think that's... <laughs> or he'll be so popular with yeah. the listeners that he doesn't have time to address <laughs> all the a, issues and know, he doesn't want to become the go-to it, person. Or, or, that, or that too is just <laughs> like, you know, if I give away my secrets, then people are going to start asking for those secrets. And then I won't be able to maintain that, you know, steady growth and that, that steady income mm-hmm. because I'm too busy helping other people get to where I am. And I want to just continue to be where I am. I, yeah. Again. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got the impression in this case, and I've heard it all because I've, I, you know, obviously working with, well, let me, let me back up a second. I haven't heard it all. <laughs> I have yet to have a, an architect a lot. killer come in, you know, I've had, you had yet, but I've heard other than that, I've heard a lot of stuff, but certainly, you know, we, we get firm owners who will come into our program and, and we'll see certain things that they're doing that are really innovative and really cool. And they'll be like, Hey, let's just keep this between us. Like, don't, don't talk about this on the podcast. Don't, don't share this with anyone else. I'm like, okay, I got it. You know? So certainly there's this aspect of, so in the industry, if you're work, let's face it, it's business is business. So sometimes if you have a competitive sure. advantage, you might not want to share that with the whole world. In this case, I don't think that's where he was coming from, which was interesting. I thought he was coming more from Corm- Cormac from what you were saying, which is like, I just don't want to make, I don't want to become a spectacle. Right. I, I just, I don't want to rock the boat. I'm not trying to be a personality. I just want to do my work over here. I have something that's working for me and, and just want to keep on trucking. But I think the reason yeah. why people, you know, come to you to talk about, you know, developing a, a different way of doing business in architecture is because we are seeing that kind of architecture as usual is broken. And, you know, maybe we want to leave our firm to, to do something, you know, it's just like, ah, I've got an idea. I can do it better. And, you know, my firm isn't open to, you know, listening to what I want to do or, you know, my innovative ideas and stuff. So I'm going to go and do it myself. And, and that's where, you know, the good thing about like the pot, your podcast is, is you're bringing to light these conversations of people who are doing that. I just, you know, I'm going to throw a little plea out to that one guest or your other guests who don't want to talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, you know, let us have this conversation because that's what we want to do is change the profession for the better. I agreed. Yeah, agreed. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I love, I really love what I do. I love, I love being in architecture, still affiliated. I'm obviously not practicing anymore, but there's, you know, it's the home. It's where I came from as, as a licensed and formerly practicing architect. But if you think about it among business owners, architects are so unique. Yeah. Like we really are not, not in a special way, like, oh, you're some special snowflake, (laughs) but like the fact that architects and the kind of are, let's face it, but we kind of are, you know, but, um, just the idea that 
uh, architects generally have an artist mind, not every architect, you know, obviously we get a lot of technical, there's like the technical side too, but typically they're going to be, they're going to be the artist types. And as artist types, I was watching, uh, I was just watching a show on Netflix the other night with, uh, I think it's Zoe's playlist of everything. Mm-hmm. Have you guys potentially I haven't seen I, it? I know that one. No. Okay. I have, I don't. Okay, my wife's getting into it. And there's a, there's a character on there. She's a landscape architect. And I always, I would love seeing the way architects Arbitrary. and landscape architects yeah. are portrayed in the media, right? Because you're like, ah, they wouldn't really want to draw like that. They, you know, they wouldn't be doing that, whatever, but it's cool. But there's this, there's this scene where she's going and she's presenting her work to the architect. And it was, it was such a tender scene. Like, it actually got me emotional because I realized, like, she was being very vulnerable and she was being mm-hmm. hesitant and she was, like, just not feeling confident about her design and really hoping the architect would love what she'd done. It was kind of, there was a whole backstory wrapped up into why she was being this way. And, and I just thought, oh, you know, I've forgotten what that's like. <laughs> you know, I've forgotten what it's like because as an architect, we do put our hearts into what we do. Yeah. There's a piece of us. We can't separate it. I know because when you're like when you're and I saw I I respect my residential architects who Mm -hmm. are out there who they do this every day. They're basically they've worked on something, put their heart and soul to it. And then they're putting it in front of an architecturally maybe uneducated client, maybe highly educated in some area, but maybe not so much in design. And it's their work. It's their baby. And that's so vulnerable and emotional. <laughs> I have a funny story about that, actually. That so so maybe it, as a, as a short aside here, a little little bit of a rabbit hole. But I was working in the office, and I was a designer. And one of the somebody made an off the cuff remark, like, "Oh, you have the fun job." <laughs> and 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 to your point, Enoch, like, is it fun to have your baby mm. ripped off the wall or? shit on right when (laughs) because that's what the critique process sometimes turns into i think everybody experiences that in school but you also experience it in the real world and there isn't not everybody is a designer in in an office right it's a very small percentage but the perception is that that's the fun job and maybe there's that's coming from a place of jealousy like i wasn't picked to be one of the designers you know the the few designers for the firm so maybe there's a bit of that there but but honestly it's like what, what are you talking about? Like, it is a very vulnerable thing. Yes, it's fun. That's why I do it. But I bet you have fun doing what you do too, yeah. right? But 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 there was this weird kind of feeling that they put out there like, oh, you get the fun job and I have, I do the real work around here. And I'm just thinking, when I pin my heart up on that wall and then somebody rips it apart, like that's actually what's happening. And and it is it's a very vulnerable state to be in and I think it takes a lot of guts to put stuff up on the wall. It doesn't take a lot of guts to go through and rip apart the details in the background, right? Yeah. And so yeah. this is where like that and I, I just I just want to remind them like you were you were an architecture student too. You remember what it was like to go through that process and you shouldn't forget it because this is where the good ideas come from. And I'm not saying they just come from the sole author. Like they come from this process. And there can be a lot of people involved in that process. But that's where the ideas come from that we then spend so much time to turn into physical reality, right? Bare ideas, newborn, baby, fragile ideas into physical reality at some point. And that's a that's a crazy process that we go through to get there so don't kill the babies like <laughs> when they're young right it it's just that that can be the, the mantra I'm for this gl- episode i'm gonna request <laughs> i'm gonna love request it. you two that we have another another episode whether it's on yours our or ours for that very topic because i could go into it and talk about you know the collective process and how you know a design isn't you know a, a sole ownership and you know, and all of this other stuff, but, you know, getting back to business of, of architecture and, and talking about how, you know, whatever we're, I don't, I've lost it now that I'm, I'm all, I'm, all I can I'm bring think, it back. All I can I'm bring thinking it back. about is how I could tear <laughs> open his, his, his point. My, my oh, baby yeah, heart, my baby, baby ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, go, going back to school in Enoch, I don't know if you've had these conversations on your show or not. So I'm interested in, in your, your take on this. But, uh, you know, I think schools are training people to go work in firms and sit in cubes working at firms. And they're not, even though the the kind of framework of our education and licensing process is always based on the 
quote unquote worst case scenario, which is you are going to be self sufficient as a sole proprietor. And so, therefore, you need to know a lot about a lot, or at least a medium amount about a lot of different things. And because it could end up that you are the person who does it all, right? That's what, when you go working from a specific role in a firm to starting your own firm, you went from doing a specific thing to doing it all, mm-hmm. most likely. And that's where we don't thrive. We don't thrive doing it all. And it's hard for us to delegate to other people or even have the money maybe to hire these different roles that where people could truly excel because that's their passion. But th- there is a lack of kind of entrepreneurial training in schools. And I'm curious your take on that, because if, if schools really are kind of just training people to go work for other architects, and then there's this real struggle when it comes to, I do want to start my own firm because they're not, we're not set up for that during our education and we're not set up for it during the licensure process really, right? So what what's your take on this like lack of entrepreneurial training because architects aren't like anybody else. They do have amazing ideas. They do have a vision of the world of what it could be that is truly incredible. Um, and yet it's really difficult to get started in practice because you're kind of, everybody's kind of starting from scratch. Yeah, yeah, agreed. You know, when, when I was just thinking back to when I was in high school and considering st- going into architecture, I certainly saw the educational institutions as these upstanding educational institutions whose primary motive was to educate the next generation, whatever that way looked like, for firms or for entrepreneurs, but whatever, to educate them. As I've become more versed in business and looked at things now, like what I realize about colleges, these are businesses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? totally. They're businesses. And so what colleges are doing with architecture is I look at it and what I can see what they're doing is they're selling a dream. Mm-hmm. That's all they're doing. They're marketing the idea of being an architect. And so that's what they're doing. So they're not, they're not, they're not really like their motive. It, let's put it this way. They, they are accountable to a certain degree for the students they turn out because there's rankings and there's, you know, there's reports where you can see how well people are prepared for the for the market. So fortunately, there's some amount of accountability there. So I believe there's some pressure on on the educational institutions to not completely blow it as it comes to architects education. But what I do notice is that at least the school I went to, a lot of the schools, they really focus on the design aspect. Like, Mm -hmm. it's almost like everyone's trying to turn out the designers because that's what everyone wants to do. That's right. You know, and so you have this flood of people who all think they're designers or want to be designers. And, and they're, they're selling the dream. They're like, hey, come to architecture school, and, and here's this, this inaccurate picture of what it's like to be an architect. Yeah. You know, you get to design all these cool buildings and everything, and then that's reinforced in school. So when I was in school, I definitely felt that stereotype reinforced. The kind of work we were doing, I mean, we were doing like, we were like the next generation of Le Corbusier, you know. We were like doing crazy stuff that had nothing to do with architecture. It was fun. It was fun, and it was definitely right. creative and everything. But, yeah, as to... Relating to the workforce, not not directly. But it was a dishonest picture of what architecture and, let's just say, the business of architecture is really all about. Because I would even contend, Evan, that they aren't really producing, you know, firm-grade architects, you know, uh, in colleges. Because as, as somebody who has to bring them in and onboard them and, and things like that, they're not prepared for the profession as you know we would if they were you know essentially going to like say a tech school or something like that that they would otherwise be but i think the impression that everyone gets is like you know this is what it, you know like this is the you know let's just the the corbusier the the frank lloyd wright you know here's the cape the cane the big hat you know here's the fancy you know this is the architect that we're trying to create and this is what we want you know this is the impression that we want to give you know the world is what architects are but they're we're, they're being a bit disingenuous in limiting them to saying it's all about design it's all about this kind of like you know hero moves of design rather than the oh and by the way, you know, if you want to like, you know, bring in clients or you know, give presentations or do all of this stuff, you have to do all of this stuff as well, because then they throw it on the profession to basically do all of the OJT, do the boot camp and things like that. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> military man exactly, speaking here. Exactly. <laughs> nice. 
Well, I, I agree with what, what you're saying, Enoch, about them selling the vision because that they have a certain number of slots that they need to fill and that, because that's the business that they're in, right? And, and so I, I agree with that. And at the same time, I wouldn't want modern practice to run these courses or these education programs either. Absolutely. Right? Because that would be brutal. I mean, we're already in a race to the bottom in our profession with most firms going after less and less fees, working more and more hours to accomplish. Yeah. Right? It, it's it's yeah. kind of crazy yeah. making. Mm -hmm. And that's yep. where we're seeing the pushback from the younger generations, right? Um, so I, I wouldn't want them to be in charge of that curriculum either. And so it's like you kind of want to cherry pick because we, we don't have an organization in this profession that has the right incentives either. We, we only have like a couple of national organizations and they're also incentivized as mm -hmm. businesses mm -hmm. themselves to bring in revenue. And so their business is tailored to do exactly that. It's either through dues or through non-due kind of revenue generation, right? And that, that's what it's about because they're paying their people to do to run that business. So it is kind of interesting that there's all of these kind of competing interests and incentives that this ecosystem that we all swim in, in architecture and AEC, and none of it is making the profession notice, notably better to go into the future in a better place than it is now. Yeah, I agreed. It's, 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 it's just so interesting. I, I love just talking about it, thinking it's a about puzzle. it. Look, yeah, you know, looking at some of the other, because architecture is, it's a technical profession, so it's basically a trade. You know, this may not land good for us professionals, but like, like we all went to trade school, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like you're going, because a, a normal degree obviously is like a liberal arts education. You look at some of the way the other, look at the way the other professional degrees happen. So for instance, law, medicine, like medicine, doctors go through medical school. They may have an undergraduate, go through medical school. Then they go to a residency, right? And a residency program, it's very different than an mm -hmm. architectural internship right. because the it's like it's almost like the firm owners are charged with paying for the education of these architects is what ends up happening right yeah transitioning from education to practice right? exactly yeah, yeah that yeah, transitional like camp, point right yeah yep yeah. and and the firm owners they they bear the cost of that because like you Cormac I was thinking when I came out of school I was worthless as doing I mean I was I could do some details some RCP plans or whatever you know reflected ceiling plans uh, you know and just some tile layouts or whatever, follow some simple, and put this hatch here, put that there, right. you know. But in terms of actually being useful, I mean, it took me a couple of years yeah. before I really got a grasp on how a building went together. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was a little bit different because... You were lucky, well, you're blessed. <laughs> no, I, I, well, I, the program you went to was different well, though, right? The pro, the pro, or, you had a different the program path. was, but you know, the path of... You know, I was in the army first, then I went to college, then I sort of ran out of money and had to drop out of college for a little while, but actually was lucky enough to get land a job with an architecture firm for four years and was basically doing uh -huh. what I would be doing after graduation, sort of mid, mid school. And then, you know, I, I went back out and in fact, actually it made me a little bit more marketable because they're like, oh, you've got four years of experience. You mm. actually can put together a set of construction documents and things like that. And and I, th you know, and, and and Evan's right. I mean, we aren't necessarily looking to be a hundred percent kind of like you know a Votech type school where you know you're you're learning this, but there are are other aspects to the the educational process that we're leaving blank. And the profession's leaving it blank too. And and you're you know you're highlighting it in just what you do on a daily basis. It's like, you know, we are. Let's. You said you said it better than I am about to say it. So, um, but we're terrible at business. You know, when we're we're coming out because we don't know. We we have it's so like where are the. Um, classes in innovative business practices. Where are just the basic, you know, business classes? Where is the, you know, you know, uh, seminars on entrepreneurship? You know, where are those things that would help us thrive as a business? Because then, because you know, if you if you start taking that and wrapping it into kind of what I was saying about, um, you know, just doing it, 
you know, like the bad habits and, you know, perpetuating the bad habits is if we're given the tools to practice business and architecture at the same time, we're the creative, you know, we're the, the creative profession that would actually probably do a much better job of creating a, a successful business if we have the tools for it. But we, you know, we, we're always playing from behind. Every time we, you know, we start, you know, like we, we work for a firm, you know, we don't really learn anything about it. So, okay, we're, we're, you know, disillusioned and we want to start our own practice. We start our own practice, but we're, we're playing from behind because we don't have that business acumen to just jump into it. So we're, we're making it up as we go along. And, you know, I, as, as I said on the, when we were talking, I, I'm a living proof of that. I jumped in, started my own practice. You know, I could say that I could blame, you know, the 08 recession as, you know, a, a part of one of the reasons why I'm not in business anymore. But I would also say it's like just the complete lack of understanding about business in general that I didn't know that I needed to basically shore up for the, you know, for the hard times. I was just like, oh, yeah, we're doing good. Mm -hmm. And then when all of my clients started saying, I'm not doing good, and pulling their contracts and, and canceling contracts and things like that, and I'm like, now what? <laughs> and, you know, and those are the yeah. things that, you know, I know that you talk about on your podcast a lot about how to weather the storms. Absolutely, yeah. I was. It's fun. Sometimes in our program, we get uh, we get architecture firms that have partners who are from outside of architecture. So every yep. now and then, we get business people who are very savvy, biz, savvy business people who decide to throw their hat in the ring with an architect. Now, <laughs> I might advise against this, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but they they do, and it's it's so interesting because when they come in. Like I was just talking, I was just talking with a, a woman who's a partner in a firm right now. She was brought in from the outside. She's not actually a partner, but she was brought into kind of a management role, and she comes from uh, another industry, the medical field, right? <laughs> and um, but not on the doctor medical side, on like equipment. So it's more of a medical administration type. Yeah, the, kind of that okay. deal, right? So she gets she gets management. She gets she understands how teams work and everything, right? And she comes in here and she's like, so I'm talking to her and she says, I just. I don't under, I don't get it why these architecture firms run like this. It's just like in any other business, when you're closing a contract, you have a whole team of people who are closers. They have the salesperson profile. They're going in there. They're getting the deal. They're doing the negotiation. They're landing it, right? And then you have these architecture firms. They're all yeah. architects, you know? And so, like, I get it because I'm in the industry, and I understand why it is the way it is, and I get the point she's making. I say, yeah, you know, for these architects to really succeed, they have to be, they got to have some sales ability. They got to have some marketing ability. If not, they got to learn it. And that's painful for us artists to try to learn because if you almost look at those two profiles, the artist profile and the sales slash marketing profile, yeah. marketing is a little closer, but generally speaking, they're on the far sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I had a, uh, a little glass of oil and water and see how those mix. Because <laughs> they don't. Yeah, yeah, shake it up for us and see, yeah, yeah, see yeah. how it mixes. So I just want to touch here as we wrap up, gentlemen. Something that you said, uh, Evan, which is boundaries at the beginning, I thought that was such a great topic because when people come into smart practice, I often ask them, well, like, how much are you working? And generally, the small firm owners we work with, generally, they have decent hours. They're like, I, work, I keep it to 40. I keep it to 45. Occasionally, we get people I'm working 60. And what I've learned over time is like, whatever, however much work you have, it will expand to fill the amount of time that you allow it. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's your life. you got to create those boundaries boundaries you have to like i have a woman who was in our practice uh she was in smart practice a couple years ago and she's a mother and so she came in with very clear intention she says i own i want to build a practice but i only want to work 20 hours a week is that possible and i said yes it's possible as long as those are your boundaries it's possible the minute you start taking on work outside of that hour because you have to then it becomes not right. possible but the boundaries was that, Evan, you mentioned boundaries. What did you mean by that? What did you mean by well, boundaries? Well, yeah, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because I think if you don't stay focused on that, those boundaries right. blur. And so I'm curious to hear from you now that you brought that story up. Like, how, how do you guys coach people to do that? Because I think this is one of those things that if you're not really clearly paying attention to it, you lose sight of it. 
and it and it does happen. And then it's kind of like boiling the frog a little bit here, a little bit there, and then pretty soon you're like your your wife, my wife is freaking out. What what are you doing? You are way too overextended. And it's like, how did that even? I don't even know how that happened. You'll throw your hands up. I I didn't even notice that it happened until it had already happened. And so I'm I'm really curious, like how do you because I think part of it is accountability, a part of it is systems. There, there's many components to help you along the way. But again, kind of going back to school and what we were trained in doing to work hard for long hours, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> that That is ingrained. And then we have to kind of sand that grain down and get back to a really smooth surface so that we can build better habits. And so coming from one place and moving to another like like you ha- that takes time to get from one habit system to another habit system but what kind of tools do you help people employ to actually accomplish mm. sticking to those kinds of boundaries yeah well certainly there's so it's up to them to stick to the boundaries for starters right so they have to of decide of course it's hey, their responsibility this, yeah, yeah this is what i want so when they when they're clear and they say this is what i want this is what I want to create. It's like, okay, we can work with that. Let's let's look at the different variables here and let's figure out how to make something work for that particular situation. So certainly systems can help out, some automations. Um, typically, you know, making sure that everyone in the firm is best utilized, meaning that if you're the owner, you're not taking out the trash. If you're the owner, you're not doing stuff that someone else at a lesser pay rate could do. But the biggest lever, the biggest lever is charging more. And mm. what most architects don't realize, and it's difficult, it's a difficult conversation, because we like to think that how much we charge is dependent upon our competition or dependent upon the market or dependent upon things outside of our control. Mm. But the truth is, is that within, there's all going to be a spread. There's people who are charging on the high end of the market. And if you look at one market, one one type, let's say luxury residential, are the architects in that market going after those projects? You'll have some, you know, that's just the 80-20 rule. You'll have like 20% who are winning 80% of the fees. So you'll have some who are extremely highly priced and you have others who are scraping to get by. And so Mm -hmm. the first, one of the big things that, you know, one of the first steps and the biggest levers that we have as we consult with architects is understanding that you can, there's a lot of delta there, a lot more than you think there is with how much you can charge. But it comes down to two key skills, marketing and selling. Hmm. So with the skills of that's what that's what the skills are in business. That's what other other industries call them in architecture. We call it business development, right? right? Mm-hmm. It's like a pseudonym because selling is a bad word, but like you go anywhere yeah, right. else. Yeah, <laughs> true. It's like it's selling and marketing. That's what it is. So, you know, you look at Gucci, right? A Gucci handbag or some of these very high end luxury items. Are they that much better or well more constructed or better stylish than the other stuff you can buy at a cheap like like 100 times cheaper? No, well, right. why are they able to charge that? It's because they understand positioning, they understand packaging, they understand marketing, they understand creating a persona and ethos around the around this product. So when we start to apply those things to architectural practices, then you can begin to move up very rapidly in how much money you're making. And at the end of the day, that's as much as we hate to say it, that's what it comes down to when you're when you're yeah. bringing. And so, a lot are of you money. using that as a filter of the kind of work that you're accepting and and therefore doing? And so, maybe you're doing less, but at a much higher rate, so you actually are able to keep those boundaries. Or are you using that another way? Well, there's those both of those. So, like, if you brought me, uh, let's say, a client came to, let's say, a client came to you, Evan, and and is you know you're going to do the project for them. Even that one client has a range that they're willing to pay you. Okay, mm-hmm. so there's probably the low range. They're, they have a low range. They won't pay you less than a certain amount because they'd be worried about you giving them a good service. So right. there's a, probably a minimum amount they want to pay you, and they probably have a maximum amount they want to pay you. And you can even press that maximum amount to more than they would have thought that they would have paid you, right? So that delta, all things being equal, the guy who knows how to sell better is going to be able to approach that maximum rate mm-hmm. that the person is willing to pay. Now, this... On the face of it, architects, sometimes when we look at this, we might have ethical problems. Why would I want to charge someone more? That seems unethical to try to get someone's maximum price. But we need to understand that, yes, if you're ripping people off and providing a crappy service, that's unethical. Mm-hmm. My experience is most architects right. aren't. My no, experience you're giving is that, somebody right, their yeah, dreams. Exactly. Right? exactly. 
you know, yeah, my experience is most architects, if they earn more money, they're probably going to put a lot more of that money into the design, into providing a good client experience, into making the whole process better. Mm -hmm. So what we stand for here at BOA is like, is, is standing for charging as much as you can, not because I'm going to be the guy who gives a shoddy product and rips people off. No, no, no. Right. Because we're going to charge a premium fee, but we're going to back that up with exceptional service because we have the ability to do that. So to answer your question, Evan, yeah, there's a couple different things. There's, there's marketing can generally increase, you know, the perception of your product, how it's presented, even how you dress, how you talk, how you speak. So that's like the packaging of it. And then also your ability to handle a conversation to take someone through a sales process. We use something that we've developed over the past 10 years called the compassionate conversation, which is a great way for consultative, taking some through a consultative framework where you're actually disqualifying them and not selling them. Mm, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very useful and it helps architects be able to figure out that top that top price i'm losing the word now but like i remember in economics there's like it's that's like an equilibrium price or whatever it's like where where demand meets supply but it's it's variable it's a lot more variable than we think it is so that's the that's what we go for is like the biggest lever evan yeah. which is just let's get really good at capturing the best fee that you can for your services and then it makes everything else so much easier yeah that's a great that's a great point and I, I definitely learned something in that short explanation even there but but and and it rings true because by doing that you're creating an alignment before you say yes to the job right in that alignment then you feel like okay no we're, we're totally going to deliver we're going to deliver the highest quality at the at the right price not not the best price not the lowest price the right price because you're meeting everybody's expectations there there's no there's no worry that that you that you're charging too much or too little for a, a too good or too bad of a, of a of an outcome but the idea that you're creating that alignment so that when you're going through that process it everybody who works in design knows that good design takes time right good design takes time in order to have time to do good design you need a good income to to mm -hmm. accomplish that right so you're creating this alignment through that whole system so that you're not overextending yourself in one of those you know categories of, of missile potential misalignment there yeah yeah and to to further because i i kind of there's a part of your question i didn't answer but so it does involve like there's a number of strategies to do it evan we talked about selling better which is being able to extract more money and i say extract that sounds kind of uh kind of one-sided but earning more money for your services from a client. And then of course there is maybe moving to a new target market, I, identifying a topper tier of clients who can um, who can afford these kind of services. So mm. we're, we're big advocates that the best way that we can serve the world and, and move forward all these ideas of sustainability and equality is by, um, is by actually making architecture a very profitable profession. And on that, I just wanna say one last thing and I'd love to get your guys' kind of closing remarks here. I've seen this very interesting thing, and this is this is not PC, or it may be PC. I don't know. I'll see how much hate email I get from this from the audience. But what I found is that um, people of color or minorities here in the U.S. are typically a lot more driven on the business side to make things work in architecture. Hmm. Okay, so like the firm owners we have, they're just. It seems like the populations who are typically maybe more disadvantaged in the profession, women, people of color, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, they, when they come into our program, we, there's a noticeable difference in their hunger to actually like not only do great design, but they're like, yeah, no, we actually want to make money too. Right. There's one of the members of our program. He's a first, he's a, he's a second generation American. He grew up as a kid in the Central Valley under grapevines while his mother would pick and harvest which mm -hmm. is mad crazy labor. I mean, yeah. backbreaking. She would have her kids out there because she didn't have daycare. So he just kind of grew up in the fields helping his mom and just being out there all day, right? This kid decided to go to school, um, loved architecture, decided to go into architecture, came to me, said, hey, Enoch, I love your podcast. Uh, we're motivated. We want to do great design. And I, I, I'm, heck, I'm in this. I want to earn a lot of money too. Came in and like within the first two months, he'd, he'd bank like $200,000 worth of contracts. Like he was on fire. 
he was on fire, able to buy a new house for himself and his wife and their new baby that was on the way in the Los Angeles area, you know? And so it blows my mind, Yeah. right? I mean, you said the magic word, right? Like hungry, it's like scrappy. Yeah. It's, it's just this, we've, I want to accomplish big things and I'm gonna do that through dedication and work, but for all the right reasons, right? Like that yeah. to me is, I love I love hearing stories like that because again like we're not we're not afraid of doing hard work as architects but I think a lot of times we approach it from a scarcity <laughs> mindset. People don't want to pay that much money. People want less design. People you know and 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 it's like this just this perception and I think the more we think like that the more it's true, right? It's it's <laughs> it's one of those self-fulfilling prophecies where if if you have that scarcity mindset that is going to be the reality for you. And so I love hearing these stories because they're, they are really inspiring. And I know you share a lot of that kind of stuff on your on the podcast and, and the work that you're doing at Business of Architectures. I mean, just to be able to share that story alone gives people an idea of what's possible. And to go back to your earlier story of the architect who's bringing in 800K a year, it's like, I think we need models like yeah. that for Agreed. the general yeah. architectural population yeah. Yeah. to see that it's possible, yeah. but also to aspire to be more like that because it, it totally is. There isn't that scarcity. There is so much work that needs to be done in the architectural realm. You know, there's all these stories about, you know, the building stock of today has to be doubled by 2050, right? Yeah. How's that gonna happen? Yeah. Are, are you telling me that there's not very much work for architects? Ooh. Are you telling me that you, can't, you have to do yeah. it for less money? Are you telling me, like, there's plenty of work, right? And so I, I, it's not a scarce, resource no it's an not. abundant yeah. resource yeah. How, do, how do we how do we make our livelihoods doing what we what we were put here to do what like exactly. this is yeah. where we can create a meaningful difference in the built environment for mm -hmm. the population at large yeah we're we're all about so here at business of architecture we're all about changing the world through sustainability having more having more inclusion having more diverse in the profession like we're all in on these ideas you know but we're all in on a different way of doing it than is generally accepted. We're all in mm -hmm. on, hey, let's teach them how to market and sell. Let's get them in their hunger, give them entrepreneurial skills, give them opportunity, and let them absolutely crush it, change the profession. And if this profession becomes more lucrative, more people want to come into it, right? If it's yeah. more lucrative, there'll be more opportunities for right. women to be able to balance demands if they want to be a mother or maybe they get pulled away from the job for a pregnancy. These things will be more possible because the the economy, you know, profession's more lucrative. Yeah. Yep. You know, if the profession's yeah. not lucrative, then if a woman gets pregnant, she's going to take family leave or a, or a husband takes family leave because his wife had a baby or his partner had a baby. It's like, shoot, this is now the firm owner's like in, in hardship because they're not making any money. It comes down to money. Right, right, right. Cormac, what do you, what do you uh, hear? Yeah, what he said. Or what he said. Whichever, whichever <laughs> direction he's <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah. Whichever direction. Uh, honest, honestly, I mean, you guys uh, did a good summary. I mean, I, I will definitely say that, you know, the the stories that I hear from people who basically had to fight to get to where they are, are usually the ones who will want to keep fighting to get to, you know, because they've always, you know, all, the reason why in a all white, all male dominated profession, you know, they're like, you know, I want to, fight. I know I can do this. I want to fight to, to, to do this. And have always been scrappers, always been somebody who's, you know, fought to, to make a better life for themselves. And they're the ones in, you know, I have, I've got a, a great friend who, um, he, he decided one day that he was going to walk away from a firm that he probably would have ended up, you know, either being a partner at, or probably even owning once the, the, the firm owner, um, retired, but he wanted to make, he, he's always made it his way. And wanted to continue to make it his way and you know you want to talk about one of the scrappiest people i've ever known that you know fights for it every single day and doesn't take crap from anyone you know about it because he's just like look i don't i don't care if you guys think that i'm you know selling out because i'm earning money i'm earning money because that's what i i'm doing this because i want to earn money i'm not doing this just out of like the kindness of my heart i mean yes i am doing this because it's a passion and i love to do it but i'm doing it also because i want to provide for my family i want to provide for myself i want to have the things that i didn't have when i was growing up 
and and you're right. I mean, the the people who you know have encountered most of the hardship or most of the pushback from the profession are usually the ones that succeed more than the ones who just kind of like walk mm. in and have that very almost entitled attitude, you know. Um, but yep, mm-hmm. yep, that's right. But, Mic drop. That's good. Let's go to wrap it up. Say no to entitlement and say yes to entrepreneurialism. This is the future, yep. right? The good news is there's always going to be opportunity for people who are willing to think innovatively, to do the work, to improve themselves, to look for solutions, to, to think that it's possible instead of just looking at, oh, it's, it's impossible. Developers, they don't <laughs> want to pay us what we're worth. Like, damn, if you actually learned how to market, sell, and negotiate, you'd, you'd find out those developers have deeper pockets than you think they do. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you for being on the show today. Appreciate it. Thanks you. for having it's us. It's been a pleasure. And that's a wrap. Oh, yeah. One more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.